Greetings folks, today we're going to do something a little different for this channel. We are going to be making some thematic lists for Tyranid armies. Now, the reason why we're doing this is one, I love the Tyranids from Warhammer 40k, they're a really cool faction, a little bit average and competitive, but I'm not really big on competitive, I'm more of playing for fun and seeing what happens. Um, and that and also their art style and the way they look is just really awesome. They're like these weird biomechanical creatures with a little Geiger inspiration thrown in. A little bit of Zerg. Although they came out before Zerg. Were even introduced into StarCraft. Or StarCraft's creation in general. Um, so, starting with High Fleet Behemoth for the first video on this little lore th theme the list we have going on here we're gonna be working on these guys we're gonna give them a list that best fits the lore that they've gained through Warhammer 40k's writing pieces and different lore aspects that we have for the Tyranids since they are the first faction what we really get to see when it comes to these guys so to start things off we are going to be reading a few history pieces out of the behemoth lore so, starting off, the first documented attack of a Tyranid High Fleet upon the Imperium was at a small research station on Tyran, uh, Tyran Primus. The Tyranids overran this isolated outpost of the Adeptus Mechanicus with overwhelming force and stripped the world of all life. By the time Inquisitor Kutman of the Ordo Xenos arrived to investigate the strange planet stripping phenomenon, it was already too late. However, the adepts of Adeptus Mechanicus who accompanied Kripman managed to gather vital information before being overrun. Magos, tech priest Varnak, had gathered information of an alien attackers into a data codex and had it in a bore shaft some 3,000 meters below the planet's surface, hoping that it would be recovered later by the Imperium. After the recovered information, Inquisitor Kripman managed to warn the Imperium of the new Xenos threat it faced. Honoring an ancient tradition of naming invading alien forces by giving them the appellation drawn from the great beasts of ancient Terran myth, this first Tyranid High Fleet was designated as Behemoth. Also one of my favorite High Fleets too, because they have like one of the coolest looking color schemes ever. Besides Ouroboros and Hydra, but we'll get to those guys later in a future video. Even a custom high fleet I made we'll get to later. Now, we're gonna skip a few of the general lore and then go over to one of the more famous instances in Warhammer 40k lore that most people know a huge amount of, which is the Battle of Macrag. Now, the fighting was intense, and every battle brother of the chapter was deployed to defend the planet. Millions of Mayetic spores were destroyed by the planetary defenses, yet millions more got through and reached the surface of the world around the frozen northern laser defenses. Oh, uh, I lost. Whoops. This is what happens when you read a document and totally skip on accident. <laughs> Alright. Around the frozen northern laser defenses batteries, Tyranid bodies stack 10, 10 meters or 10 feet deep. So corpse covered was the ground, in fact, that one walked on the corpses and not on the frozen, so uh, frozen soil. The entire veteran Ultramarine's first company was wiped out, an enormous loss that the chapter could ill afford. Unknown to Ultramarines, however, High Fleet Behemoth was in reality split into two forces, bouncing off each other as if they gorged on the worlds they invaded. The Ultramarines' victory at Battle Macrag had only destroyed half of the enemy's strength. However, the arrival of Battlefleet Tempestus, the major fleet of the entire Segmentum Tempestus, brought much needed reinforcements to still this threat. Now, judging by the little snippets of lore we read there, we'll get to some more later for our choices, we can base this High Fleet army on two things. The, uh, three things, technically. First, these were the first Tyranid High Fleet that the Imperium has really 
had a hang for and fought and dealt with to the point where they've lost so many soldiers and so many people due to this invading threat that they had no idea what they were dealing with until it was too late. High Fleet Behemoth was a very strong High Fleet. It was the most primordial of the bunch, if you will, and the most invasive, strength-empowered, swarming High Fleet. So when we're, when we're messing with our High Fleet list here, we are gonna start off with a battalion detachment and we'll get to our spearhead detachment very soon. Before we do any of the major army buildings, we're gonna start off with the HQs. HQs in 40k is like your leaders for the army. And then when we select a warlord, the warlord is like the head honcho of your whole army, like the guy who's in charge of everything really. And all the other HQs are kind of like his generals. So, starting things off with our battalion detachment, we are going to be using a Swarm Lord, since it fits a big part of the theme with it being the most primordial and beginning part, due to the fact that the Swarm Lord revives itself time and time after again from constant battles, and it has seen many a fall upon its kin. And it's also a really powerful unit. It's about 250 points, kind of expensive, but the things it does is really... It's really what sells it. Um, one of its abilities is called Blade Parry. Add one to the Swarm Lord's invulnerable saves against wounds caused by melee weapons, which is very powerful against a lot of uh, melee based units, especially other Tyranid armies. If you ever fight another Tyranid army with your Tyranids, or like Oryx or um, Death Guard have pretty good melee too. Anything that involves melee, it will at least help the Swarm Lord survive from those attacks. Uh, another ability it has is Hive Commander. In each of your shooting phases, you can pick one friendly Hive Fleet unit within 6 inches of the Swarm Lord. That unit can move and advance if you wish, as if it weren't... Oh, as if it were the movement phase instead of shooting. Which is very... which is a very strong ability, given the fact that... Uh, for instance, you could move the unit, and that specific unit you don't have to shoot with. And then, using this ability, during the shooting phase, you can have that unit move even closer. This is very effective on uh, units who can do shooting and melee, such as the Tyranid Warriors. That way, after doing their first movement, you can have them move again and get closer to your enemies, not only to take out a few units in melee range, but if any of them have a certain like weapons like flesh hooks or these pine fists which count as pistol weapons, you can also technically use those during that phase. Once it gets to fighting or something like that. I'm not a 40k expert. I I started around 7th edition, like very late into it, and then I really started playing 40k around late 2018, around uh, the time of 8th edition. So far, 8th edition is great. And I'm excited for once the new things in that we have coming up, because I'm a Necron player and I'm loving the stuff I'm seeing already. Back to Tyranids. <laughs> uh, two other abilities this guy has is a uh, Psychic Barrier. So a model with the ability has a 4 plus invulnerable save, which if we go back to the Blade Parry, that adds 1 to the Swarm Lord's invulnerable save, it would actually create that 4 into a 3 plus. So that way, when you roll for your invulnerable save, which is like a saving throw, but better in some cases, uh, you can definitely take out a few of the things you're getting hit with. Uh, as usual, with all Tyranids, they have Shadow in the Warp. Enemy Psychers must subtract 1 from any psychic tests they make if they are within 18 inches of any unit with this ability, Tyranid Psychers are not affected by this. And then Will the Hive. The range of this model's Synapse ability is 18 rather than 12 inches. Synapse is a very important thing to keep control of a lot of your Tyranid units, specifically things like Tyrant Guard, uh, Swarm Guard, Termagants, Hormagants, all the little guys that you generally make a swarm amount of are going to need this ability. 
uh, the ability really makes sure your your smaller units, if they're out of range of the synapse ability, um, they get like a minus one to their charging and movement, as well as being able to hit with any melee or shooting weapon. Uh, synapse is very important in that case where it, it just makes sure they don't have that disadvantage. Generally in some armies, I've actually seen where the units without a synapse benefit can actually do really well and not get screwed over by that. And uh, as far as the weapons go in the Swarm Lord, they're just four sabers and a pincer tail. The uh, the sabers pretty much deal three da uh, three damage on a hit with AP minus three. So AP means armor piercing, which affects saving throws uh, only, not invulnerable saves. I, th I think for the most part, um, that would make it so. Let's say you had a a unit that has a a 4 up save, which means if you roll a 4 or higher, your unit is fine and not dead. This will make it so it will become a 7 or up, and on a d6, you can't roll anything higher than a 7, so that unit's instantly at a disadvantage. And as far as the prehens out of tail goes, it is just a, a d3, so you roll a, a d6, and then you'll get a 3 or lower from that to distinct how much damage you got which each time the bearer fights, make one and only one attack with the weapon, in addition to the bearer's attacks. Which, the Swarm Lord can have about six attacks. So about five of those could be the weapons uh, of the Bone Sabers, and one of those could be the Brienne's Outer Tail. The Bone Sabers, going back to that, each time you make a wound roll of six plus with the weapon, the target suffers a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. Mortal wound is almost like a like an insta-kill, if you will, for those new to 40k. It it just means that they are that unit you're attacking is just down. You don't even have to deal with rolling. It's just down. So since we have our Swarm Lord right there, we're going to make it our Warlord. That way it will be in charge of attacking anything. We're going to give it the power Smite, which Smite is a, um, is a casting ability for Psykers where the closest enemy... A uh, unit within 18, 18 inches of the Psyker suffers D3 mortal wounds. If the result of the Psychic test was more than 10, the target suffers D6 instead. Now for the Hive Mind Disciple, we are going to give the Swarm Lord a Catalyst. So you will select friendly Tyranids unit within 18 inches of the Psyker until your next starting until your next Psychic phase. Each time a unit suffers a wound, roll a d6 on a 5+, plus, the damage is ignored, and does not lose that wound. It's good, you can use this to switch out with another ability, so we'll keep that tab. But we're looking for a behemoth-specific one, which is Unstoppable Hunger. Select one friendly behemoth unit within, eight, uh, within 9 inches of this Psyker. Until end of turn, when resolving an attack made with a melee weapon by a model in that unit, add 1 to the hit roll. Sorry, to the wound roll. It's a pretty good little ability. We'll just give it here since it is a thematic list. Now for the Warlord traits, there's Alien Cunning, which is at the start of the battle round before the turn begins. You can remove your Warlord from the battlefield and set them up again as described in the deployment section of the mission you're playing. If both players have units that can do this, roll off. Uh, this will... This will really come in handy for the Swarm Lord since it is a very strong unit, but with many large units in 40k, they get done, gunned down pretty easily in like the first turn or second turn because they are high priority targets compared to uh, smaller infantry. Now, for the other two HQs we'll be adding with the Swarm Lord, will be based on the lore, we will have a Let's see here, where is the Tyrannofix? Unless if that's Tyrannofix, we can only have as a heavy support. Oh, okay. Oh, whoops. Well, let's skip ahead and we will add a Tyrannofix as our heavy support for this Tyranid army. Uh, the reason why is because part of the lore, uh, Bane of Shaoyor, when a Fragment of Behemoth threatens the Aldari maiden world of Shariyor. 
Craft World Bailton unleashes the vengeful oh unleashes the engines of all. The pristine surface of Shao Yur plays a host to a titanic clash of towering bio monstrosities and a graceful Eldari gravitates. Stalking through the carnage comes a Tyrannofex that the Eldari named Bane of Shao Yur. Its colossal biocannon obliterating enemy vehicles with every peristaltic blast. The loss is mounting, the warriors of Belton are forced to abandon Xiao Yor, the Great Devourer. To the Great Devourer. Based on the lore, <laughs> uh, Tyrant Effects is pretty strong, which, when it comes to the unit, yeah, unit, unit's pretty strong. I mean, uh, it has a weapon called Acid Spray, which it has 18 inches, heavy 2d6, heavy meaning that it can shoot as long as it didn't move. Uh, it, deal it has AP minus 1, deals D3 damage, and the weapon automatically hits its target. It's almost in a way similar to a flamethrower where they automatically hit. It also has uh, something called Stinger Salvo, which has about 24 inches of range with Assault 4. So if you don't want to use the heavy weapon and you want to move your Tyrannofix out of the way of something, you can still use an attack since assaults work when you when you move and then you shoot after. Uh, usually assaults like for example like two or something you'll get a penalty for shooting after moving but since it is assault four you don't have to worry about that. Now with the powerful limbs it's just a melee attack in case anything gets into melee range. So we'll have that. Now back to our HQs, another we're going to have hanging out with Old One-Eye is going to be a uh, Tyranid Prime. This will be very important in the fact that we're going to be throwing in a good couple amount of Primes. Now with this particular setup, we are going to give him Flesh Hooks, Toxin Sacks, uh, adrenal gland, and then for his for his bio artifacts, let's see here. What would best fit Behemoth? Probably the thing that goes to Behemoth. <laughs> hmm. It's a little tricky here because now we start getting into weird combos for Behemoth. It is a thematic list, really. The reason why we're choosing a Tyranid Prime instead of like another Hive Tyrant or something like that is the fact that um, the Tyranid Prime with Alpha Warrior, you could add one to hit rolls for all Hive Fleet Tyranid Warrior units that are within six inches of any Tyranid Primes. Very important, which will even beef up your, your other Warriors, which are going to be having in this list. Uh, this particular list will be uh, not too tanky, but good enough to take a few hits, especially the fact that it is based off primordial instances of Behemoth. And a lot of the, uh, the flesh hooks here have about a 6 inch range assault 2 and the weapon can be fired within 1 inch of an enemy unit and can target enemy units within 1 inch of friendly units. Pretty, pretty good, pretty strong. Now for the bio artifacts we can give this guy Let's see here. Pathogenesis. At 8 inches to the range characteristic of ranged weapons. Nope. We need something that fits in better. Hmm. We could give it a Norn Crown. Friendly high fleet units do not suffer penalties for the hit rolls and charge rolls incurred from instinctive behavior ability whilst they are in 30 inches of the model. Perfect. Now, for the last HQ, we will be using a Trigon Prime based off the lore of Drake Slayer. On the frontier mining world of Kurnov, Watch Sergeant Dramas of the Death Watch slays the subterranean terror known as Obsidian Drake, ending the Trigon Prime's decades long reign of terror, which, which the Trigon is another bearer of our high fleet. 
So we'll be adding a Trigon Prime into our group. Okay. I accidentally added the Trigon Prime into the uh, Spearhead Detachment. We'll get to that after we add the Tyranny Prime to our <laughs> main army. We will get this one Toxin Sacks, Adrenal Glands. Uh, we won't give it Flesh Hooks though. We want this to be more of a uh, quick striking sort of guy. Oops, that's a Tyranid Prime. <laughs> Alright, Turbo Goblin. There we go. So we'll give it the Power of Smite, we'll give it Toxin Sacks, we'll also give it Adrenal Glands. Um, Hyper Adaptive Biology. Nope. We won't give it a Bio Artifact, I think it's fine. Alright, that's done for our Battalion Detachment, and we'll go over to our Spearhead Detachment. Now the reason why we have a Spearhead is that another piece of the lore is that Old One-Eye... <laughs> yeah, Old One-Eye is one of my favorites, I'm thinking about grabbing him for my army too. Uh, Old One-Eye was the Carnifex who spearheaded the Tyranid High Fleet Behemoth Assault on the Ultramarines, Ultramarines World of Kalth. Swatting away Lehman Rust battle tanks as if they were insects. Its rampage was stopped when a forgotten hero of the Imperium fired a plasma pistol through its eye and into its brain. This shot was the first time Old One Eye was brought down, and it is still unable to regenerate its eye and is permanently scarred with a plasma burn running across its skull, which is why the Old One Eye model has that exposed skull and battle damage on the face. Solar decades later, after High Fleet Behemoth had been driving out of Kath, a band of smugglers stumbled across its body, frozen intact in the ice packs of Kalth. They thawed it out, hoping to get a bounty for the corpse, but Old One-Eye's grievous wounds instantly began to heal. It soon awoke and slaughtered the smugglers, isolated from the tiered hive mind. A carnifex reverts to its instinct to mindlessly kill, and so Old One-Eye's release heralded a series of Tyranid raids on Kalth. Land convoys were destroyed, Habdome smashed and entire populations massacred. There were also other uh, low-level Tyranids left behind from High, Fleet's Beha uh, High Fleet Behemoth's invasion, which are Termogots and Gene Sealers. These will come in handy for our little detachment here. So first off, we're going to have good old One-Eye. He'll be our Warlord. We will give him... Tenacious Survivor, which means roll a dice each time this Warlord loses a wound. On a 6, the Warlord shrugs off the damage and does not lose the wound. Comes in handy for our little lore here. So, so far, our little Behemoth army consists of a Turbogon, Stormlord, Tyranid Prime, Tyrannofix, and Old One-Eye, based off of lore, and our squad. Coming up at around 896 points out of 2,000 points. It is time for us to start throwing in little guys. Since we're in a spearhead detachment, we'll add in some gene stealers. We'll add in termagants. And then we will add in two more carnifexes. This will be pretty much the the army spearhead here. So we're going to give the carnifexes uh, adrenal glands. We will be giving them Chitin Thorns, which means at the end of the fight phase, roll a d6 for each enemy unit within one inch of any models with Chitin Thorns. On a 6, that unit, unit suffers a mortal wound. Now we'll give him a uh, monstrous Crushing Claws. We will also give him a... Uh, hmm... We'll also give it Strangle Thorn Cannons. Actually, no, we'll just give him monstrous scything challenge. Just have a big guy. Now that we have those set, we'll give it a bone mace. Pretty much we're going off the theme with these card effects of being a very strong, heavy hitting unit. With our termagants here, we will give them devourers instead of flesh borers. 
devourers are very a very neat little weapon in the fact that they're they're just a little better than a flesh core since after moving they have an assault three so they won't have a penalty to hit as heavy as it is for like an assault two they have strength four ap zero and damage one but for these guys with a whole squad of them it will come in handy We'll also give all them toxin sacks and adrenal glands. Now moving on to our gene stealers. We will we have about 10 of these guys hanging out here. And we will give them all toxin sacks and extended carapace. We'll have And that's it for that section. Now let's go back to our main battalion attachment. Now we're going to add our Tyranid Warriors. We'll just have a huge, a huge mass of these guys. Then we will have our Termagants. We'll add in our Hormagants. So starting off with our Warriors, we're going to give them all the same thing. Toxin Sacks and Adrenal Glands. The reason why we're giving them adrenal glands and toxin sacs, is so that way, uh, when they hit a target, it's gonna hurt since toxin sacs on a 6 plus in the fight phase. Remodel with toxin sacs causes one additional damage. And the adrenal glands just make sure our guys get in. To the squad, we are gonna be adding about three more of these warriors. Actually, why don't we add. This is just going to be a giant chunk of warriors to make almost like a weird uh, a phalanx for our army here. Just to block up some hits and deal some damage and get in, tear some things up. We will have about nine of them. We'll have one bio cannon in here. Alright, so we have one, two, three... Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine warriors. Each of these warriors, we're going to give a a death spitter, and we will also give them a lash whip and bone sword. The death spitters are pretty powerful in the sense that they have 24 inches of range, almost like a tiny sniper. They have assault three, uh, strength five, and AP minus one with one damage. Not bad. A Lash Whip and Bone Swords, on the other hand, uh, it gives them about AP minus 2. Their strength is based off the unit's strength. Uh, they deal 1 damage, but in case of your Tyranid dies before attacking in the fight phase, the Lash Whip and Bone Sword will make it so that the bear, if the bear is slain in a fight phase before it makes an attack, leave it where it is. When its unit is chosen to fight in that phase, the bearer can do so as normal before being removed from the battlefield. Which pretty much means it can attack before it leaves the battlefield. Like a, a second death, if you will. And we'll just give these setup. We'll give this setup to all of our all of our Tyranids in this little group here. Being the fact that they're all like little primordial beings of destruction and have a pretty good little setup here. So we'll just do that real quick. Not giving him two scything talents. Whoops. Give it a devourer, minus set, lash with the bone sword, give him a lash with the bone sword. Like that. None. Oh whoops, that's better. Alright. Now that that is taken care of. We have our Hormagants. The Hormagants, we will give Toxin Sacks as well. We also give them Adrenal Glands. And we're going to make this a squad of 30. So we have a bunch of little guys running around. We'll do the same thing with our Termagants here. Uh, by giving them Adrenal Glands. Since they have Flesh Pores. be pretty good. We'll have about... Let's see here... We'll have 30 of these as well. Nice. And to finish off, this is our lore-based High Fleet Behemoth Army. 
So the list is right here. I'll write it down in the comp in the video section. Hmm, interesting. So it's saying for the heavy support, we need a a minimum. Oh, we need a two more selections for heavy support. Interesting. Well, you can add more card effects, change it up a little bit. Whatever you feel like doing, really. This is just a list based off of the lore and a theme of making very hard-hitting and semi-tanky Tyranid army. You can easily adapt this to be your own army, change it up a little bit based off the list here. And before we close out the video, we have a Turvagon, Swarmlord, and a Tyranid Prime for our Battalion Detachment HQ. We have 30 Hormagons with Adrenal Glands and Toxin Sacks. We have 30 Termagants with Flesh Borers. Sorry, not with Flesh Borers, with um, Devourers. We have 9 Tyranid Warriors, each with a Lash Whip and Bone Sword and Death Spitter, alongside Toxin Sacks and Adrenal Glands. And then for the Heavy Support, we have a Tyrannofix. Over in a spearhead detachment, we have our old one eye. We have gene stealers and termagants. The gene stealers have toxic sacks and rending claws. As far as the termagants go, they have the devourers as well. Actually, we will move our tyrannofix into the heavy support for the spearhead detachment. There we go. All right. Then we have our two card fixes that are just beefy. That is our list. Semi-tanky Tyranid High Fleet with a lot of small guys running around doing damage. Some uh, nice little Tyranid Warrior Phalanx. And just a lot of HQs based off the lore. Other than that, that is it for our video. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the comment sections below. Or if there is a Tyranid High Fleet you want to see based off of lore or even your own that you've made your own lore for, feel free to leave it in the comment section below and I'll probably do a video on them. Other than that, you folks have a great day. Take care.